Would you like to support Nintendo Prime, but you don't have any money? Maybe you don't have an ability to pay for anything online. That's where Gawkbox enters into the equation. Down in the description below, you'll see a link to gawkbox.com slash Nintendo Prime, where all you need is a smart device of some type. You go to it, you sign up for an absolutely free account, and you play some games, you download some apps, and you will get a sponsored tip uh, that helps support our channel. And all I can say is, if you do this, I greatly appreciate it. So... This topic was brought up by IGN. So I'm going to give full credit to IGN uh, for this topic. They put out a video a few days back about how the Nintendo Switch, uh, they, they boldly say that third parties are out of excuses. And I wanted to expand on this because they did a, a little short conversation with a bunch of cutaways, clearly cutting out a lot of in-between chatter. And I just want to focus squarely on the third-party problem that Nintendo has had over the years. So Nintendo's been driving third parties away for a long time. This dates all the way back to the N64 days, if we're being completely honest with ourselves. After the whole fallout with PlayStation and the failed partnership with Philips, uh, Nintendo started losing their third-party support to platforms that were more available let's say to third parties easier to develop for uh less restrictions and nintendo really stuck to this old policy of theirs from back in the nes days which when the nes came out that policy that nintendo seal of quality policy was important to reviving the industry because part of the reason the industry crashed is there was so much shovelware coming out uh, that people had a hard time finding the good games. And because a lot of people's experiences with the new Ataris and such were terrible experiences, people just stopped buying them. And it's kind of a problem that Steam is running into. Something like 5,000 games or something being published on Steam this year. And uh, a lot of them are not very good. And when you have a lot of not very good games, it can lead to oversaturation of bad titles, which makes it harder to find good titles, which can lead to a platform ultimately crashing. Now, is Steam going to crash anytime soon? I don't know. Steam does a pretty good job of promoting the good games and getting them in front of people. I mean, think of how quickly, you know, Player Underground's uh, <laughs> battle or... Think about how quickly Pug G is just blown up. Uh, so obviously, uh, Steam still has a way of getting the really good games in front of consumers. And until that stops, uh, and until it just starts being every time you load up Steam, you're just seeing a pile of crap uh, thrown at you right away. I don't think Steam is going to be greatly affected. But back in the day, this was a huge deal in the video game industry. And Nintendo had these policies in place that helped turn things around. And they maintained those policies with the Super Nintendo, which at the time made some sense. Uh, plus, their only serious competition was the Sega and Sega Genesis, which did well for itself. But uh, Nintendo was clearly the market leader still. Well, PlayStation came out and kind of took away the market leader from Nintendo. And Nintendo saw a, a pretty big drop-off from the Super Nintendo to the Nintendo 64. Now, there was a drop-off from the NES to the Super Nintendo as well, although that drop-off wasn't quite as big. It might have just been because of the introduction of the Sega Genesis. But the PlayStation really ate into the Nintendo's market share, and third parties really started hopping ship on the Nintendo 64. Now, obviously, there were still third-party games on the Nintendo 64, but there was less of them. Uh, Final Fantasy, you know, was an example. It was a huge game on Nintendo systems through the Super Nintendo, and it completely hopped ship over to PlayStation. And this continued for many years, and it just got worse as the generations went on. Um, Nintendo kind of maintained their Nintendo seal of quality type restrictions. I'm not going through all of them. There's so many of them. Uh, really into the Wii era. And really towards the end of the Wii era, they started relaxing on that policy and realizing we really don't need to be so restrictive. Now, obviously, at this point, Nintendo's other issue with third parties, once you got to the end of the Wii era, is that Nintendo's hardware was so different from what the other competitors were doing that... Third parties just really didn't feel like supporting it. And now we're getting to a decade plus where third parties have been leaving Nintendo and now they weren't really being incentivized to come back. It was still harder to develop for. Uh, you still had to customize things for a completely different hardware set. Uh, and things really got really bad in the current generation. 
when Wii U, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 were going toe-to-toe -to -toe against each other, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One were built on the x86 architecture, whereas Wii U uh, was still built on the old Wii architecture, uh, just you know, newer versions and, and more RAM thrown at it and more of this thrown at it. And while it was an HD console with the capabilities um, you know, ahead of an Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, the differences in raw you know, performance between an Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were not very good. Uh, it, it was only slightly better than that. And here I am talking about the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in an era of the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. Can you see the problem with that? And this is in addition to the copious amount of other issues that the Wii U had. So Nintendo really had this third-party problem. Uh, while they had the control scheme back, they did not have the power again. They didn't have the install base. They did not have the clout they once did to kind of push third parties around and have them release their games anyways. So Nintendo almost got humbled, right? The Wii was so successful for a, a, you know, a very different reason. It was lightning in a bottle. The types of games that sold best on the system uh, were not the types of games that most third parties made. And it was just lightning in a bottle effect that gave Nintendo a false sense of security. And they kind of came back down to earth, crashing really hard with Wii U. And Switch is now here. And Nintendo Switch has reminded people of a number of things. It is still behind on power. It's not as powerful as an Xbox One or a PlayStation 4. But see, the form factor it gives you, the sacrifices to do what it does, are different in the marketplace than a console like Wii U. When you're putting a box underneath your TV, you expect it to be pretty close to on par with other boxes that are put under your TV. Hence, if Nintendo released a traditional home console in 2017, it would be expected to be pretty on par with a PlayStation 4 Pro and an Xbox One X. I mean, there's really no reason for it not to be. Those would be the latest boxes coming out underneath TVs. And if Nintendo is going to charge $300 to $400 for their own box, it really needs to be something that is impressively on par. But that's not what happened. Nintendo went a hybrid route with Switch, a system that you could play on your TV, but also take with you on the go seamlessly without really much effort at all. And because of that... Not being on par with even the base PlayStation 4 and the base Xbox One is deemed acceptable because we're not talking about a platform that's directly comparable. Yes, it is a system you can put under your TV, but really it's a system you're probably going to set next to your TV because you can just undock it and take it with you. And that take it with you factor, that playing games on the go factor, means that the expectations for performance are going to come down. And so people are willing to accept the Switch as an underpowered console gaming platform because it is portable. It's a sacrifice that consumers understand on the surface. People don't expect things that you have in your pocket or things that you play holding in your hands to be as powerful as something that sits underneath your TV. So with that in mind, Nintendo also did some smart thinking with the Switch. They teamed up with NVIDIA and NVIDIA has been huge in the console gaming space for a long time. To give you an example, in my PC gaming rig, which also obviously doubles as my editing rig, I have a GTX 1070. That is a, you know, a, a close to top of the line it's not a 1080 1080 ti or 1080 xp but it is um, among their top cards in their current gpu stack for gaming and that's a really really expensive card so teaming up with a company like nvidia who's got all this long history with pc gaming is important and it was important for the switch in terms of attracting third parties back. Now, their Tegra technology is mobile technology. Make no mistake about it. It is a gaming-specific mobile technology, at least the X1 version is, but it is still mobile technology, which means it's not going to be as capable as, say, their typical Maxwell graphics cards. However... It is extremely capable, and because it's made by NVIDIA, it's also extremely compatible with PC hardware. This is important because it means porting games off of PC to a Tegra APU is actually a lot easier than people realize. In fact, getting Unreal Engine 4 support on Switch was fairly simple. Epic pulled it off really easily because of the way the X1 is comparable to a PC and how it handles things. So, 
all of that being taken into consideration, the Switch is actually the perfect platform for portable third-party console games. And this is where we run into third parties running out of excuses because while it's neat in theory for the Switch to be the perfect platform for portable home console gaming, it's also one of those things that someone has to do it first. And now people have we're not just talking about 2k whose nba 2k 18 game is a, a pretty on par comparison to other versions of the game um, although the game itself is a little disappointing uh, we're not just talking about fifa 18 who's using an older engine so it's kind of like oh well there's fifa 18 but it's not the true fifa 18 no we're talking about games like doom we're talking about uh, Wolfenstein, <laughs> the new Colossus. We're talking about Skyrim. We're talking about L.A. Noir, which is being remastered for current gen consoles. And we, you know, we, I'm sorry, uh, and Switch is one of those current generation consoles. It's being released on day and date. So we're getting to this point now where third parties are already proving it. There are third party companies, including ones that traditionally do not support Nintendo systems, like Bethesda, going out of their way and supporting the switch full stock giving it all it all the games that it possibly can right now and it's leading to the realization for me and i think for many gamers out there that there is no more excuse in 2018 i will still give certain third-party developers an excuse for 2017 you had to play wait and see with nintendo they just came off their worst generation of gaming ever in terms of sales uh, they just came off you know, a decade plus worth of driving third party companies away uh, and a decade plus of you know no one else really being super successful on Nintendo's platforms outside of you know companies that uh, made Nintendo like games. As an example, there's a story I thought about reporting on today, but I kind of backed off it because I feel like it's obvious uh, Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Metal is now the most successful on third party game on switch but again it's a very nintendo like game it literally has mario in the title um it's literally a crossover game so while it is a third party game fully and wholly developed by ubisoft i don't i don't think that's a very good uh barometer because it's still very much a nintendo game and nintendo's copyright is still very much on it so uh yeah it's i don't think that's a the headline i'm seeing out there i don't think that's fair i think it's cool to talk about the sales of the platform obviously that means it's probably so close to a million units on the mpd report but it's still uh not something that i think is uh I think it's being misrepresented a little bit in reports. Uh, even if the report is technically true, I don't think it's an impressive remark to talk about. Now you talk about uh, NBA 2K18, you know, selling you know a million plus units. Now we got something to talk about with third-party success on Switch. But yeah, third parties are really running out of excuses, and I'll, I'll give them a pass this year because we didn't know what the Switch was going to be. We didn't know how successful it was going to be. Uh, but now that we have third parties putting effort into it, if these games sell, that's the only caveat. The only excuse left is that third-party games do not sell on Switch. And if Doom fails to sell, if Skyrim fails to sell, if L.A. Noirs fails to sell, if uh, Wolfenstein 2 early next year fails to sell, all right, you still have one excuse, and it's a pretty important excuse. You know, game, third-party games don't sell is a pretty damn big excuse. But if these games do sell, and they sell over a million units each or more, especially this early in the Switch's life cycle, we got to be talking about how there is literally no excuse anymore. In 2018, the new Assassin's Creed, the new Call of Duty, the new X, the new Y, the new whatever third-party game is being made, Switch should come into consideration on day one of development. Uh, so yeah, it's it's gotten to that point now with these major third-party companies showing their big open-world gory shooting. All these games can run on Switch the walls have been torn down nintendo somehow kept up with having a less powerful system but still bringing back third parties it's crazy but nintendo found the one way to do it and i applaud them for it and third party companies you better be paying attention because if these games start to sell and you continue to ignore the platform you are going to be missing out on a potential money train over the next few years because it's very apparent that people want console gaming on the go and Nintendo's giving it to them in spades, and now we have other companies like Bethesda and Rockstar jumping on board. It's time. It, the time is now. If your game is not coming to Switch in 2018, the only excuse I want to hear out of your mouth is that Doom and Skyrim and all these other third-party games that did it first just did not sell.
That's the only acceptable excuse in 2018. And, I, and here's the thing. I don't think that's going to be an excuse. I think the games are going to sell. So I, th- I think pleasantly so for many companies. But, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Uh, third parties, better get on board, man. Don't miss this boat. Don't miss this money train boat. And you know what? I normally don't care if your games sell well, but I am a Nintendo Switch owner, and I would love to have a day where I don't need to own another home console. I can just own my gaming PC and get all the games I want between my PC and Switch. But right now, there are still some console-exclusive uh, multi-platform games that I need other systems for. Uh, Madden is one of them. Please, 2018, make it a reality. Everything comes to Switch. No downported messes in terms of uh, using different uh, different engines and, and dropping down features and stripping things away like EA has done. It's time. Full console ports. Let's do it. 2018. I am Nathan Ruffle Jets from Nintendo Prime. If you like this video, you know what to do. And if you dislike the video, that's all right. Hit that dislike button. Subscribe for more. And I will catch you guys in the next one.